We start now with uh, a panel, and before we have a short uh, uh, film, short movie. Um, and uh, I would like just to introduce that briefly, and also introduce the moderator of our next panel. And uh, until now, we have been speaking a lot about uh, business and also how the porn tube is changing the pornography market and the consumption and production of that. And uh, an idea also that we had was uh, to try to address somebody from this business. And it uh, was totally impossible to call here people that are actually producing and uh, running tube platforms for reasons that you can easily imagine. Also, as we said before, a lot of them are illegal, a lot of them produce pirated contents. So was we really try and try, was no way. And I think this is, uh, I mean, explain a lot. So the idea was still to have somebody that uh, could uh, speak a bit from the business perspective. And uh, also I wanted to have somebody that uh, try to deal with this idea of the sharing of pornography and the new, uh, if you want, uh, um, social media platform strategy, but still is trying to do something a bit different. Um, and she defined it as fair trade porn. And I'm speaking about uh, Sasha Shonen. She is the CEO of uh, Piggy Bank Girls. Uh, that is a erotic crowdfunding uh, platform for girls, and she will explain how that works. But basically, the idea is that uh, uh, everybody could uh, become a member of this platform and uh, uh, try to um, have a goal that could be any kind of project uh, you want to be funded. And then uh, you do your performance, that could be various, as she will explain, and then there will be a crowdfunding uh, pledge. And if you will get the money, of course, you can do your project. And so Sasha really wanted to be here, but didn't manage because also they are moving uh, the company headquarters. And so we decided it was nice still to have her present. And she did uh, this video just for this event. And also she actually told me that if you are interested in asking her something, uh, you will see on the video her email, and she is totally up also for answering to first her question or getting in contact with you. And uh, after that, uh, I would like also to introduce briefly the next panel. And we call it Explicit from Porn Tubes to Online Sex Working. And I will leave to Francesco Warbear, Macarone Palmieri, the duty to introduce all the wonderful speakers we will have with us. So I will just introduce him. And uh, I'm also really happy to introduce him, actually for the second time, here at this Disruption Network Club, because he was already moderating our keynote in the Cyborg event in May. Uh, but uh, this time, of course, is a different <laughs> subject. And uh, Francesco, we have been also working a lot uh, since long, and uh, he's also a wonderful uh, person to work with, I would say. Uh, always really challenging and uh, interesting discussion. Uh, she's a, uh, he is a social anthropologist <laughs> and a geographer of sexualities and cultural producer. At the moment, uh, is uh, working as doctor uh, candidates at the Department of Civil Building and Environmental Engineering at La Sapienza University of Rome. And so usually his work uh, focuses on new media, net porn studies, and the epistemology of emotions. And uh, he recently published a book that is called Tanz Berlin, Oltre il Muro del Clubbing, that was published uh, in Italian from the Manifesto Libri. Uh, and uh, is at the same time also co-producer and residence DJ of the Berlin-based bi-monthly queer events Gagen at the KitKat Club. And as I say before, this night also we will have another party at the KitKat as uh, partner events and uh, Francesco will also play there again. And uh, so I will then remind you about this party next time <laughs> uh, when I will come on stage. And now I would like to leave to you to the video of Sasha Shonen and uh, then uh, the panel uh, that will follow. I just want to warn you that the sound sometimes is a bit tricky, also because the film was uh, shot in the office. So it's really done in the moment of uh, working. So 
I'm sure you can understand that is not uh, really total studio quality, but still we think is an important testimonial to bring to understand also how people are de dealing with this new form of business connected with pornography. So thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Sasha Shonen, the CEO of Piggy Bangles. I apologize I could not be in Berlin, but I'll try my best to explain everything through this video. If afterwards you have any questions, do not hesitate to contact me under Sasha at Piggy Bangles. And right now I'm gonna start the presentation. Piggy Bangles is an erotic crowdfunding website where girls can fund their dreams. Here is the first explanation video so everybody knows what we are talking about. Welcome to Piggy Bank Girls, the first erotic crowdfunding site where you can help girls to meet their objectives and receive erotic rewards in return. You can help a girl to buy a new dress, a trip to China, or participate in a good cause. In exchange, you'll receive erotic rewards directly from them. On Piggy Bank Girls, the girls can choose the content type they want to offer as rewards themselves. It can be videos, pictures, webcam or video chat sessions, the shipping of garments or other things. And you also can ask for something you want to receive as a reward. Everything's possible. Piggy Bank Girls is a platform with fair conditions for the girls. It promotes respect and equality in the erotic industry. And the girls get the greatest possible part of the games. We're fair trade born. Do you want to help real girls and receive juicy rewards? It's really easy. You just have to register and in a couple of minutes you can contact them and help their cause. Discover how good it feels to do good on Piggy Bank Girls. The first erotic crowdfunding for girls. So, I hope everybody understood approximately what we do. We started this project one and a half year ago. The idea of Piggy Bengals came up by talking to the girls who were working in the erotic business. We were told by many of them that they didn't do this just to get fixed income, but more for a reason or a specific uh, dream, let's say. And we realized that this reason is something that can make erotics much more personal, and it's greatly appreciated from our bakers. Bakers are people who are donating on our website. This is why we made re the reason of the girls the central point of Piggy Bengals. So right now I'm going to show you a video where we explain how to make a campaign and what people get for rewards for the donations. Meet Tina. Tina is a normal girl. She works in a coffee shop to be able to pay for college. She wishes to fly to China someday. For this trip, Tina needs flight tickets, hosting, a travel guide, a dictionary and much more. Unfortunately, Tina can't afford all this, as her salary at the coffee shop is not enough. Tina tried to get the money in different ways, but nothing proved to be working out. Luckily for her, there's Piggy Bank Girls, the first erotic crowdfunding site, where girls like Tina can get funds to accomplish their wishes in exchange of erotic rewards. She just has to follow three simple steps to start her campaign. She starts with the description of the campaign, selects the duration and quantity of what the project is supposed to collect. Tina makes a video presenting herself and explaining her campaign. She adds the reward she wants to offer in exchange for donations, specifies how much she wants for them, and describes their content. Afterwards, we will ask for some personal information before her account and campaign will be validated and, shortly, the campaign is going to be online. Tina can use social media to share her campaign and get more supporters. At the end of the campaign, Tina will get 80% of all the money funded during the period. Do it like Tina and let us help you with your dreams. Start your campaign on Piggy Bank Girls today. So, I hope everybody understood how to create a campaign. Okay. So, to the concept of fair trade porn, we consider that girls have to come us first. Which is why we try to keep a fee as low as possible. We take only a 20% fee, so what's quite unique in the adult industry. So, 
Other than a mainstream crowdfunding platform, the girls get the money even if they didn't reach their goal. So for example, the girl wants a thousand euros for her dream and she only reached 800. So then we will still give her 80% of the 800 euros. The reason a girl starts a fund on piggy bangers, this is like very different. It can be a tattoo, vacation, for studying, or also sometimes like to help other people. So for the Bosnian or Serbian flute victims, we had a few campaigns about this as well. So any reason, it, it can be anything what the girl wants. So now we will take one campaign as example, so that we better understand how it works. So we take the example of Blondie Fesso. She's from Barcelona and she decided to make a campaign to save the rabbits of Barcelona. They are abandoned every day and that's why she wanted to try to save them and for that she needed money. So she made a campaign on our page with a presentation video that we are going to watch now so that everybody knows what she do and why she does it. My name is Blondie Fesser, and as some of you may know, I'm an adult film star. And well, um, a few days ago, I decided to start a new campaign in piggybangirls.com because I want to talk to you about Save the Rabbits. That's why I'm wearing this outfit. Um, Save the Rabbits is an animal shelter uh, for rabbits and a small rodents that is located here in Barcelona, where I live. Um, as most of the animal shelters, their mission is fighting against animal neglect and abuse. The thing is that here in Spain, three rabbits are abandoned every day. And I'm not even talking about guinea pigs, rats, and hamsters. So the number is quite bigger than that, unfortunately. So please, don't buy animals. Mm, it's not fair, as it isn't buying children, for example. The thing is that someone's getting profit off of their lives, and they're not things. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, nasty big mafias around there. And trust me, you don't really want to know what they do to breeding females. And the animals, they cannot sell. So... Uh, if, you, if you're willing to get a new friend, first of all, and very important, think about it. You need to. Uh, think if you have the time, if you have the patience, if you have the money, and if you have the love to take care of him or her. And second, uh, go to your local shelter. There are millions of animals waiting to be loved. So... Um, save the rabbits as a rabbit shelter. They need to they need to complete the cycle. That it's a rescue, um, healing and socializing, and finally the adoption. Um, one thing is that most of the animals that come to the shelter they come in very bad conditions. So. Um, there are quite a lot of bad bills to pay, um, medicine to buy, and basic stuff as hay, pellets, um, things for hygiene, etc. I personally like um, recycling, like doing um, houses for them out of paperboard boxes, um, hay pans, or homemade tunnels. But there are some things that we need to pay with money. And I really want you to help us and to help them. So, I know there are quite a few things about me in the internet around there. Mm, but trust me, this is exclusive material. And you're just gonna find it here. So, if you decide to collaborate, you will get nicely rewarded. Mm. So, I hope everybody understood why Blondie Fresa made a campaign on our page and that you got a bit of feeling of wanting to help her. If yes, please do so. On Piggy Bangers, the nudity is an obligation for the girls. So what I mean with that is that we have girls who are not like webcam girls or professional girls in this industry where we, that we would like to 
to give their help as well. So for example, a girl has a problem and uh, she has two children and her car broke down and she cannot pay for it, that she needs to go to work, to school, she would lo lose her job if she don't get her car repaired and this kind of things. We would like to try to help also these people if, for example, she would say, okay, I would like to make a fund and I will only be in underwear, make some dancing videos and this kind of things. Uh, this is totally possible. We do not uh, have any obligation of the girl having nudity or hardcore videos. It's, everything is allowed as long as the donors know what they get for what for the money they give. So this is one of the reasons uh, I think that some girls who are never have been on erotic websites come to us and make a video and put a little a mask and nobody recognize them and she can still get the money for her campaign. So, in any case, uh, there was one question I had to answer and it was, is it difficult to be a woman CEO in the adult industry? So, I thought a long time about it and I think it's not more or less difficult to be a man or a woman. I think it's hard to start a website, to get the donators, to get the girls, to, to get the technology right in the right way. So I think it's not more or less difficult to be a woman or a man. I just think that if you make a project and that you believe in it, so you have to do everything for it and it will be hard for men and for women, but that if you work hard then you can get somewhere. So I hope you enjoyed the video and that now everybody knows where Piggy Bangers is about and uh, that I explained everything fine. So if you have any questions, any doubts, or if you think, oh my god, I have a great idea and I want to share this with Sasha, then do not hesitate to send me an email on this address and I will be glad to answer anybody. So now I hope to see you soon on piggybangers.com and I wish you a great day. I thank you, uh, Tatiana uh, and uh, Disruption Network Club uh, and Betanian uh, to give me the possibility to moderate this panel about porn tubes, please. Uh, because this is part of the work that I am, uh, it's an ongoing research that I'm doing since like 2009 and 2010 and then I presented uh, in a different context. So this is an upgrade of this work and I'm very happy to develop visions with you. Uh, and to speak about porn tubes, basically, uh, I have to say that, of course, this is um, one of the last phenomena of online porn. And I would like to give, give a contextualization um, and trace a genealogy in three simple internet steps. So step one is related to the explosion of online porn in the beginning of the internet era. And I'm speaking about the World Wide Web and uh, in, the in the Yahoo times, in the Yahoo research engine times, where you had forums and internet relay chat. And I refer to this period of online uh, porn as the real core, which is a concept of Sergio Messina that was saying that real core is, was opposed to hardcore and softcore commercial standard. So it was a porn of like daily people uploading their contents online just for the pleasure of doing that. So it was like a, a, a body politics, but without a proper ideological frame. Then we have step two. Step two it is the user-generated porn. What is the user-generated porn? As porn comparison were colonizing the internet, user-generated porn appeared with the engineering standard of the web two. One, from one side, we had uh, the blogosphere, the online video consumption, and the beginning of the social media format who gave new possibility for self-representation and online body politics that this time were framed with a, an uh, ideological frame that was feminist, that was queer, and, a, and uh, even if uh, it came out on a specific standard model, which is the SPQL or, uh, you know, like the Web2 uh, standard, it was having like a, a kind of ideological frame. But on the other side, this process grounded the big data capitalism with a core of few world enterprises like all, you know, Google, Facebook and so on, it's all these social media that are competing for the big world market competition, basically. This is called the big data capitalism. And then we have the step three, that is the post-digital porn phase. So the grounding of big data capitalism created a post-digital moment of online porn. The post-digital idea is defined with specific characteristic. It does not recognize the distinction between old and new media. It tends to focus on the experience instead of the concept. Uh, 
And it looks for DIY agency outside the big data capitalism, but in the same time, it commercializes this experience too, very fastly. It's called accelerationism. So porn tubes are the expression to me of this like late post-digital moment. Applying the YouTube social media structure to an accelerated porn experience with an endless cruising was the trick that made a new model emerge. This model now brings an enormous range of themes and problematics. And I illustrate three, which are the basic structure of this panel. The first one is the anthropological changing of the sexual experience. The second one is the privatization of the sharing concept with new monopoles and crowdfunding sourcing strategies. And the third one is a full new wave on online sex workers with older problematics, civil rights, and new political actions. So to discuss this and many other themes related to uh, porn tubes, we have an incredible lineup today. So I thank you very much for coming here. And I'll do a very short round of presentation. So on our right, we have Nishant Shah, who is a uh, professor and researcher on digital politics and sexual identities from India and working in Germany at Lofana University. Then we have uh, Roy Klabin, uh, <laughs> who is a documentary filmmaker and investigative reporter from the United States. Then we have uh, Liad Hussein Kantorovic, uh, who is a performer and sex worker activist from Israeli Palestine but she's working and living here in Germany. And then we have P.G. Machotti, who is a researcher and sex work rights uh, consultant living in, between Germany and England, or just in Germany, right? Just in Germany, in Berlin, and working in Berlin too. So <laughs> I uh, want to start uh, uh, with uh, Nishant uh, Shah, and I would like to give some more elements about your work. So uh, Nishant Shah is a co-founder of the Center for Internet and Society in India, and a professor of culture and aesthetics of digital media at Ljubljana University in Germany. His work looks at an intersection of technology, gender, sexuality and identity, and political action, and he remains invested in doing cross-cultural and multi-stakeholder research toward open and equal societies. His presentation will be, uh, uh, it's a very beautiful title, I really love it. It's called, Nothing Shall Come of Nothing from regulation of porn to porn as regulator. So I leave you the mic and I thank you very much for coming here. All right, um, thank you very much and good evening. It's very difficult to follow up after piggy bank girls. Um, <laughs> but, but we'll try and figure out how it goes from here. So it's always interesting to talk about porn because as we all know, one of the biggest concerns as a researcher is that we don't really do enough theory and practice together, right? Um, but porn becomes one of those entirely inclusive sites where you can be absolutely sure that everybody who theorizes is, is a self-avowed consumer and a practitioner of porn as well. Uh, and so I'm kind of trying to keep a bridge between some theoretical insights, some academic knowledges. I promise not to do any name dropping or any references right now, uh, but take you through a bizarre journey of trying to figure out a very simple thing which has been at the crux of a lot of the work that I've been doing right now, which is trying to figure out the distinction between love and porn. Yeah, and if we kind of figure out and go in that direction, I'm, I'm presuming that it might give us a new way of thinking about maybe regulations of pornography. Because we already know when it comes to pornography, right, that the famous uh, court case judgment goes, um, that the only way to know porn is to see it. Um, the idea of the invitation that porn offers to the spectator to be necessarily entrenched in a condition of seeing, in a state of visuality, uh, is at the center of most of our understanding uh, of what is porn, how it should be regulated, uh, and what the implications are, right? So the thing about porn is that without a spectator, there is no pornography, that there is an intended spectatorial position that's always invoked, and maybe we need to start dislocating who that intended spectator is uh, as we come towards the digital domain and the user-generated content, um, the idea of the porn tubes. And in order to do that, I'm going to take you to the biggest pervert of all ages. His name is William Shakespeare. Um, and in the play called King Lear, Shakespeare tells us the story of a king who summoned his three daughters and asked them to quantify how much they love him. 
The two elder daughters plumb the depth of metaphors and the height of poetry to explain how much they love him, but the youngest daughter, Cordelia, remains silent. Lear asks her what she has to say, and Cordelia's response is nothing, at which Lear offers the most quoted line from the play, nothing, nothing shall come of nothing, speak again. Cordelia's incapacity to compute love, uh, her inability to perform her feelings, to count the ways in which she loved, was seen as an act of willful perversion in the universe of King Lear. It was a moment of the obscene, so huge that it leads Lear the king to banish her from the kingdom and for Lear the father to disown her as his daughter. If this is a story that had unfolded in the 21st century, life would have been much easier and the play would have been much shorter because Cordelia could have liked him, followed him, plus one him, tweeted him, shared him, hearted him, whatsapped him, sent him an image emoji or at least an Amazon gift card, and we could be sure that the crisis of the perverse or the moment of the obscene would not really have mattered because it would have the capacity of being counted. So this incapacity of measuring love and the moment of obscene and perverse that it produces is what I'm fascinated by. Because it's clear that our understanding of what is love and what is perversion is largely contingent upon what is calculable and measurable and what isn't. Or in other words, it's determined by our notions of affection and affectation. If you can count it, it's love. If you can't, it's pornography. Yeah? And that's the basic proposition I'm offering to us today. Which is why, and this is not really very unfamiliar to us, right? Because uh, uh, when you talk about like first throes of love, young teenagers falling freshly in love, uh, the conversation never really takes the kind of gravity or poetry that Romeo and Juliet have in Shakespeare, right? Most of the conversations that happen between two people is incredibly banal and exhaustively uh, repetitive, where the first person says, I love you, and the second person says, but I love you even more, and the third person, and then the first person says, but I love you even more than that, I love you to the moon and back, I love you till infinity, I love you till whatever. You can see I grew up in the 90s, um, right? <laughs> These are all love songs um, from the 90s. There was, we also had our creepy set, every move you make, every step you take, I'll be watching you. Yeah, stalker <laughs> alert, uh, right? Um, but in all of this conversation, it's difficult to figure out what is affection and what is affectation. Um, that um, they are both blurred and blended form of something that is at once funny and fond, but also uncomfortable and unsettling. Because just one false answer and the entire situation can turn sinister very, very fast. If just one of the persons in the conversation steps back and saying, thank you very much, but this is getting way too personal, uh, you immediately know that that condition of love, which is no longer reciprocated, which is no longer calculated, which cannot be uh, in the same vocabulary of intensity, immediately lends itself to the libidinal, the perverse, and the obscene. And it's great to be making playlists where we put things like that, right? Um, I'll, please forgive me, I'll never stop loving you, really. Uh, and we know that the distinction between the suitor and the stalker, if you are watching reality TV like Bachelorette, for instance, that it's a very thin, line, a thin red line and that it's very visible. The banality of this conversation is also fascinating because it has nothing to do with the content. It sounds real, authentic, and genuine because it's not attempting the kind of poetry that cultural objects often pretend to. It's entirely about transmission, connectivity, reciprocation, and feedback loops. The emptiness of the message when you fall in love, its complete meaninglessness is not a bug but a feature of the system. It marks the presumed relationship of non-performative and hence visceral, right? Something that you really feel. And beyond the manipulations and mutations of representations that we have become so wary of. It is this nothingness and how we balance it uh, as also to be seen the measure of what is pornographic and what is not. Because for all of us who are, I'm hoping, connoisseurs of pornography, um, love dwells in silences, whereas porn needs moaning. The production of porn 
through cultural industries has been obsessed with this filling up of the nothingness because the pornographic performers in these texts are not allowed affection, authenticity, or anything that is real. At the same time, the biological reality of the pornographic body, the moment of the orgasm, the performance of pleasure, the cum shot, are all celebrated as the only true visceral forms of performances which are available to us. Or in other words, porn is devoid of meaning when it comes to the bodies and their actions, but it is the sublimation of the excess that makes it so obviously obscene and perverted. This contradiction that's often embedded in pornography is not often revealed and hence comes up with these spectacular campaigns like Make Love Not Porn, where apparently people are going all around the world asking serial masturbators to take their hands off their genitalia and click on a button and saying, we do not like porn anymore. Sorry, that's not really going to happen. Um, but apart from these kinds of campaigns, we start realizing that there is a large body of regulation around pornography which also revolves the idea of the something, of the present, of action, and of representation when it comes to porn. The obsession with making meaning of what is visible and present thus produces a very narrow vocabulary and grammar of identifying and pathologizing porn practices. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this wonderful website called Is It Porn? where you can submit an image and it will tell you that this is 1.9% certified not pornography, right? Um, this one, on the other hand, is 60.6% .6 certified, so it very well could be porn. And this pixelated image is 100% porn. This is porn. Unfortunately or fortunately, the website's right now shut down because they couldn't keep up with the amount of people who needed to submit images to figure out if what they are watching is pornographic or not, right? Um, <laughs> But this is very symptomatic of different kinds of regulation structures which are set around pornography because it reduces the work, the intention, the form and format of porn to merely nudity, sexual intercourse, and naked bodies. I think the wonderful keynote we began with this evening showed us very clearly how much goes into the performance of pornography, which is both at the level of visceral, of affective, of negotiations of power, of connecting with people and building communities, which gets completely reduced if all you think about is pornography as this content-laden, heavy thing where all our anxiety is going to be about whether the nipple is showing enough for it to be pornographic or not. Um, so, my, the minute we move away, I'm suggesting for us, uh, to move away from thinking about pornography through the lenses of representation and content, when we are able to locate the pornographic principle not in the banality of the body, but in the circuits of circulation, transgression and affect, we might have a shift from concentrating on the pornographic work to the work of pornography. So I'm no longer interested in decoding what is porn or what the aesthetics of porn are or what are the ways in which people are consuming it, but that pornography as a cultural artifact and as a digital artifact has a certain work that it performs in the regulation of our societies and the production of our identities. And I want to shift this visual paradigm for you by looking at one of my most favorite porn sites right now, and this is called pornforthblind.org. Uh, you might really want to go and look at it. There is a huge list of very interesting arguments to be made about what happens when copyrighted pornography gets produced as porn for the blind. And I'm going to leave you, uh, begin with at least one clip. If we have the time, I'll come back to more clips to just show you the incredible eroticism of the porn for the blind. Uh, if you want, you can close your eyes and we can even shut the um, lights and you can listen to this. Located at http slash slash uh, http colon slash slash www.comeoverload.com slash preview slash two dot htm. Um, the site is uh, a bright yellow background. Um, the clip itself is surrounded in a green background. Uh, at the top right corner, there is a woman uh, in, partaking in vaginal sex. In the upper left corner, uh, there's a woman partaking in oral sex. 
um, the title Cum Overload is above several clips of women performing various sexual acts. Um, okay, we're going to start the clip now. Okay, it says, uh, presented by iDream Network. Um, there's a woman who is sort of vaguely trying to cover up her vagina. She's looking into the camera. And uh, now there's a uh, point of view shot down from a, uh, a man receiving oral sex from the woman. Um, she is licking the shaft of the penis. Um, she's also giving uh, a partial hand job. Um, she's mostly focusing on the uh, head of the penis. Um, she's continuing to give uh, oral sex. Um, now she is giving a, a hand job in front of her face. Um, she has uh, recommenced the, uh, the uh, oral sex. Um, she continues the oral sex, uh, fade to black. It says, come overload an iDream Network, hardcore cum shot movie site production. Join today and get daily updated movie content. Um, this has been uh, a porn for the blind presentation of Come Overload. This was a 53 second preview clip located at http colon slash slash www.comeoverload.com slash preview slash two dot htm. Porn for the Blind is a nonprofit organization based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So, so I hope you shared that moment of collective ecstasy. Um, <laughs> And in other lifetime, you can say that the same city that produced Facebook also produced this particular website and that it completely makes sense. Uh, there are so many different layers to peel this out, but what I'm really interested in, again, is to look at the banality of porn and how it's fascinating that if you look at legal court cases about pornography and obscenity, they read exactly like this. Yeah, legal transcripts about pornography look like that. The woman now has her sh hand on the shaft of the penis at 35 degrees angle and repeatedly moving it very fast so that the man looks like he is slightly angry or he is about to scream. Right? These are the kinds of descriptions that you find in like legal court proceedings about pornography as well. So there is this banality and triviality to porn uh, that I'm presenting to you is that we need to kind of move beyond. And once we do that, uh, we might be able to start looking at a different kind of an aesthetic of porn and the different kinds of regulatory structures, and I want to offer three propositions based on it. I had a huge ethical dilemma whether to show you this video or not, and I decided not to, but it's on YouTube and you can have a look at it. This is the story of Amanda Todd. Has anybody known that name? Is that a familiar name? Amanda Todd was a 14-year-old girl in Canada who was a victim of something that's very benignly called slut-shaming on the internet where, like many young teenagers, she was seduced by a stranger online to reveal her sexual body in very compromising positions. Those images and videos were then circulated in her school. She was bullied for about a year and a half until she finally makes this particular video. It's called a note card video, where you don't really see the face of the person who's speaking it, but you have a series of notes that they are presenting to tell their story. This is the last video that Amanda Todd ever made because four hours after she made the video, she went and killed herself, yeah? I'm presenting to you that this is the new pornographic. That the ways in which we have obsessed about pornography merely as sexual intercourse and its representations doesn't allow for these kinds of underbellies of pornography which are embedded in user-generated content, in sex, in revenge pornography, in slut shaming, and the ways in which we are continuously exploiting and different ways uh, erasing bodies of young people and especially young women on the internet. That in order to look at the kind of safeguards which should have been made available to Amanda Todd, which were zilch, like zero, right? Um, it really becomes very fascinating because when you start looking at the number of regulatory mechanisms, processes, and appeals which are available to sex performers in Canada, and you compare it to what are the kinds of appeal processes that Amanda Todd could go to, it's 843 is to three, right? That's the ratio. 
And I'm suggesting that if we do not look at these new kinds of sexual expressions and desires, which are about the work of porn, as opposed to pornographic work, then we might be not able to ask for successful activism, which is embedded in looking and going back to the questions of safety, security, harm, dignity, and the right to life. That we need to be able to reformulate uh, the work of porn, not merely in the morass of obscenity and prurience and we keep on defending about how it's free speech and expression and so on, but you take it one step further and start looking at what are the ways in which porn is right now one of the biggest forms by which shame is being regulated for people. Yeah? So not shame in just consuming porn, but shame in being rendered as pornographic uh, in different forms. Which leads me to the second proposition I want to make for this evening. Um, which is the shift from the consumers of porn and porn actors to the workers of porn. And there are a whole range of invisible workers of pornography uh, which need to be invoked. This image is one of my most favorite images this decade uh, because it is three ministers sitting in the parliament in Bangalore, in Karnataka, one of the home states I lived in, and they are watching porn while they are sitting in the assembly. Unfortunately, they forgot that the democratic proceedings of parliament in India are always captured on camera and they are, dis they are like shown live, which means that the national television carrier for 14 minutes actually promoted porn because on its live telecast it was showing these three ministers and the screens that they were using and the entire country, if they had been interested in watching democratic proceedings, would have seen some fantastic pornography uh, being given, to, given it to, uh, out to them for free. But this particular idea about how only some people get affected by porn when some people are the ones who need to be protected from porn is something that I want us to kind of renew attention on. Because increasingly we are reaching a point where there are people who are hired to do nothing more than watch pornography. One of the biggest employers of, what pe of people watching pornography is Facebook, which has something called its cleanup crew. When was the last time you saw the picture which was really disturbing on Facebook? Somebody being beheaded, being gang raped, brutally murdered, different kinds of degradation. It's not as if the world is nice and people are not uploading those things on Facebook, but that Facebook actually has a real-time crew of people who are largely sitting in Philippines, Indonesia, and India who are doing nothing else for eight hours a day in Berlin as well, is it? Amazing. Um, yeah, who are sitting, in, doing nothing but eight hours a day watching pictures which might be so offensive that Facebook's regular user should not be exposed to it. Yeah? I'm very curious about how our conversations about pornography, about what kind of visceral effects which we are going to talk about are going to intersect with these kinds of post-colonial practices of labor and the kind of workers who would never get acknowledged as the workers of porn that to bring them back into the equation along with people like Amanda Todd who might not necessarily have the safeguards and protections which are given to performative or descriptive pornography have to be brought back into account. And the last uh, uh, thing I wanted to bring to you was another video which I don't want to show because it has non-consensual material in it, but it is right there on YouTube and it's still available for people to watch, which is a certain kind of video that's getting very popular, very popular in India, but there are lots of instances elsewhere. In India, these are called khand videos uh, or masti videos, which are both words for prank as well as scandal. And they are very common to the kind of hazing videos that frat boys have been uploading from America, for example, or in Britain, where we have been told they wore, wear uniforms, and we know what people wear in uniforms too. Um, so there is this certain way by which uh, things which are not fitting into the template of pornography are often the ones which are the most abusive in terms of sexuality. This particular video that I have not, sh I'm not showing you the image for is the image of, is a moving image of five men in a hostel in the north of India who are taking a shower and then one of them points out that the other one has a hard on 
and then there is a camera in the place and they whip it out and they are following this guy documenting his hard on and about why he has one. And it's a six minute video where they are laughing about it. At some point, uh, they start hugging together. This is heterosexual men just having fun and play. Don't get your hopes high. Um, they are just having fun and play and so on. And at some point, the video cuts down and you have no idea what's happening in it, right? It's the most non-pornographic thing that you can ever imagine. But in a country like India, where there is no authentic pornographic performer, because it's illegal, for example, these become the only forms of homoerotic expression which are available to young people. Just two more okay. minutes, yeah? Um, and that there is a way by which this video is interesting because there is, this is being consumed as pornographic even when it was not intended as pornography. And then when they do that, you get this incredible homo bashing, for example, saying everyone's not gay like you. The minute somebody articulates a homosexual desire based on consuming these semi-naked bodies and this close documentation of somebody's penis, they are immediately going to be blamed, shamed, and attacked for being gay uh, within that particular context. Right? So this capacity of things to be rendered pornographic as opposed to things which are pornographic is the, is the new aesthetic of the digital. Uh, and one of the best examples of it is this horrifying uh, Facebook page called Women Who Eat on Tubes. I don't know if you've seen it. Apparently, there is a whole bunch of men in London who get a kick out of taking pictures of women who are eating food on a train. They take it, they upload it, and they all come together with thousands of likes and say, what a slut, right? This capacity of the digital to expose you and to render you and to make you into a pornographic object is maybe where the new conversations are going to be. And so my final proposition to you then is to not think about merely the regulation of porn, uh, because that takes us to the older idea of good porn, bad porn, free speech, expression, which are so tied to representational politics. Instead, maybe we need to start looking at porn as a regulator. Once we recognize what are the ways in which what becomes acceptable porn and what is not, what is given the safeguards and the protection of pornographic regulation and what is not, we have a new set of terrain to kind of tread forward, trying to look at new ways by which safety, protection, and dignity can be afforded to bodies which are not pornographic per se, but are digital in their nature, and hence essentially, easily rendered as pornographic. So I'm going to stop here, and thank you very much for listening to me. What an amazing presentation. Thank you very much. It's like full of um, ideas and uh, inputs that we're going to discuss later. Because now I want to introduce uh, Roy Kablin. Roy Kablin is a, a graduate of the Columbia University School of Journalism where he focused on documentary filmmaking and investigative reporting. His master project profiling three major New York drug dealers was published as a feature in The Atlantic. Right? He has written articles about crime and corruption, emerging technology, and the modern media landscape. He's currently producing two documentaries, one centered on a young Israeli soldier, and the other one on a flourishing startup preparing to launch their product. With his report, Internet Porn, How One Sleazy, Low-Breaking Company Owns All of It on the Web, he defined very well the corporate dynamics at the back of the major porn tubes and traced the path of the Internet Porn Monopoly. So, uh, thank you for coming here, and we uh, really aim to hear you. Thank you very much. Would you believe this is the very first image that comes up when you Google pornography? No, 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 absolutely not. Um, so, as he said, I, I wanted to analyze uh, porn as an industry uh, because a lot of the time in investigative journalism, we have to approach um, institutions and companies or military, people that don't like to share their information. And me and my colleagues have had a lot more success dealing with drug dealers and soldiers and politicians than we have with the porn industry. And the more we dug into it, the more we realized it's because there is one massive monolithic presence that owns all of porn on the internet. About 90 to 95% of what you view online is owned by one pyramid company. And that was a revelation to us, and so we had to dig into exactly how that was accomplished. Because when we think about pornography, especially on the advent of the internet, I think uh, people like our keynote speaker Carmen thought at first that the internet was going to be 
a massive new way to access audience, uh, a platform for free expression where everyone can kind of connect and share ideas. And that dream is actually turned into the complete nightmare opposite where there's so many restrictions on the ability to be creative, to be expressive in erotica, and the vast majority of the money goes to one awful company. Um, it's kind of fascinating how little we know about the porn industry, especially because, by statistics, we spend about 38.5% of our internet time enjoying pornography, and yet we don't know much data about it, we don't know much about the trends. So I want to start off by asking one simple question. Uh, who pays for porn? And that's legitimately, if you could raise your hands, for the porn that you watch, does anyone here pay for it? You pay for it? <laughs> Some of it. Too. Yeah, okay. Not all of it. An anomaly in the room and the appropriate reaction of shock. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because every single one of us is guilty of going to the most convenient, abundant outlet available to us. And you should all feel very ashamed because people like Carmen work very hard and the vast majority of us kind of take it for granted that because tubes are the norm, that's the avenue we should be pursuing to indulge in our endless erotica. And um, I wanted to quickly as I can explain how we went from the days in the 90s where if I had a porn magazine in my hand, I was the most popular kid in school, and these treasured, tangible products that we had, whether it was a DVD or a magazine, kind of transitioned into this endless world where with a mouse click you can enjoy pretty much Alice in Wonderland's endless loop of fetishes, kinks, erotics, and images that you can hope to watch in a lifetime. Um, and there's another appeal where I think the shame factor that people were starting to kind of accept, you saw porn magazines everywhere and DVDs everywhere, and maybe in the late 90s and early 2000s we were coming to accept sexuality, that's kind of had an inversion because with the tube sites, you don't download anything onto your computer, you don't pay for anything, there's no credit card history, there's no trace. So you can kind of go back into that shadowy, shameful culture where it's just something you do, everyone acknowledges that we all do it, but we don't really talk about it openly and fairly. Um, so with all of these dynamics, the question has to be, how do porn producers actually make money? And this is the enemy, MindGeek. It's a company that used to be called Manwin. And if you look at that, that does not look like the typical porn landing page. And if you go to their homepage, they will very much try to sell themselves as a server service or an ad revenue service. But this is the company that owns 95% of everything you see online. And the way they did it was in the early 90s, uh, before Google, before we had any kind of search engine. Uh, and if you were a stupid kid like me, that the best idea you could come up with was typing boob.com to look for nudity. Uh, the only other avenue you had available to you was referral sites. And these were sites that aggregated together lists of all the places online where you could find erotica, sexual content. And by clicking on one of the links on that list, that site would get a referral fee. So if you were very good at aggregating lists of all the best porn around and people knew your brand and came to you, all those clicks would ag aggregate many pennies and cents, which would add up to many, many dollars. Manwin was one of the most successful companies to do that, and then they started down this path of pretty horrible business practices. They took half of their money, and they headed towards California to partner with the porn producers. They started making content the same like anyone else. They became everyone's new best friend because they were making porn in the traditional sense with the studios, with the content producers. They were buying up old content from porn producers who thought there wasn't an audience anymore, and they were building up a huge library. On the other side of the coin, they were investing in this YouTube kind of culture of streaming to create the very piracy sites that were stealing all of this content from their new friends and partners in California. So they have this presence of popularity on one side and they are the very pirates that are vampiring away everything that they're working towards because they knew that eventually this would be the new cool. Um, their massive network is probably many sites that you're familiar with and were mentioned, uh, YouPorn, RedTube, Pornhub, the vast majority of any kind of tube sites, it's within this umbrella company. And they were smart enough to diversify and make several brands because they knew that people in this urge to constantly find the new are gonna wanna go to different thematic tube sites that maybe cater to the more extreme, to the more beauty aesthetic or the more fetish oriented. I think there's, of the popular tube sites, only two that don't belong to MindGeek. They are X Videos and X Hamster. But they still pretty much steal pirated content, so I don't know that there's an ethical ground to them either. 
At this stage, by the time the porn producers in California realized that their new best friend was actually their worst enemy, it was almost too late. They are mind geek as an umbrella. They consume more video bandwidth than Amazon, Facebook, and Twitter combined. They are in the top five uh, bandwidth consumers on the planet. Their sites get 100 million unique visitors a day, and more importantly than that, the users stay there for more than 10 minutes. Now, in advertising terms, that is considered, I think the technical term is a fucking gold mine, because no one stays for more than two minutes anywhere on the internet outside of maybe Facebook. Uh, so if you can guarantee that your audience is there watching whatever it is your content is, you can sell a lot to advertising. You can sell a lot and make a lot of advertising revenue, which is why their homepage, again, looks like that, instead of a little bit more explicit. At this point, it's very hard to stop piracy. As Carmen mentioned, you can petition and try to you know, take down a copyright infringement request, but that takes money, legal fees, something that production companies and porn producers have less and less of, whereas ManGeek has infinite amounts of it. On top of that, it doesn't really stop or control what users upload because it's espousing itself to be this user-oriented place of free exchanging ideas, which kind of appeals to half of the hacker crowd and another people might see the underbelly of it and feel a little remorse. But the problem is, if I have a pay site that requires people to pay a membership fee, any one of my users can log in on the first day, download my entire library, and within one day upload all of it onto a tube site. And you can't stop that mechanism. So as a result, MindGeek became the dominant industry distributor. And at a certain point, people kind of gave up fighting them which was the biggest windfall they had, because if everyone is going to a tube site to find porn, and you are a porn producer trying to get your name out there, you almost have to show your content on these tube sites so that anyone becomes aware of you. That goes for brands, for producers, and for the actors involved. This kind of forces them to be in this parasitic uh, dynamic, and by 2008, we saw a massive plummeting of DVD sales. We saw huge pay cuts for performers, and most of the actors and performers we talked with diversify the way that they make money. So they will do things from selling panties to uh, paid Snapchats, um, webcam services, and even for the most part, the vast majority of American actresses now are doing some form of escort service to diversify, and the porn is almost an advertising flyer for them to meet clients. Um, so it's not too dramatic to say that ManGeek devastated and erased the porn middle class. And what they did was even worse after that because once these companies were on the verge of bankruptcy or strug struggling, they bought them. They swept up and bought these big brands that you might recognize from banner ads, whether it's Brazers or Digital Playground or all the big names. So it became at a certain point a hostile takeover and now Almost every single production company either is owned outright or works in partnership with ManGeek. Now, that kind of model doesn't really exist. We don't have consolidated distribution like that almost anywhere, even with some of the really more perverse monopolies that exist in the world. And the real twisted issue is that ManGeek doesn't care about the porn. It doesn't care about the content. It's all a means for them, having as much diversity as they can in one place, to get eyeballs to the site, to get that 10-minute waiting period so that they can sell ad revenue. The porn producers don't get any of that ad revenue. They have very bleak partnership deals where they will get paid to make these things if they're in partnership, or they'll still see their stuff pirated even if they have a formal arrangement. So. The only comparison I could think of would be is if Disney World owned the Pirate Bay. That's like the only comparison I can imagine because this scenario is so absurd where the people who are producing the most also own the means by which that content is pirated. It would be unnatural. And the people in the middle are the few artists who are passionate enough about making erotica to try to hold on and struggle. You have to ask, why was this allowed? Why is no one discussing this? Uh, why are there no class action lawsuits? Why aren't there any antitrust cases going against ManGeek? And a lot of that has to do with business, but more importantly, it's the social stigmas that we've been discussing here, uh, where people's view of porn has kind of migrated again into shame or misinformation or culture clashes in America where it might be religion versus sexuality and in other countries where it might be bureaucratic, theological, you go to any country and there's a different clash with sexuality and sexual expression. So 
the hidden danger here with this monopoly is if something happens to MindGeek, if in one felt sweep MindGeek goes down, the vast majority of porn online goes down because we'd have to completely hit the reset button on how we find it, how we collect it, and how we connect to it. So what are the solutions? And this was the interesting part of the research because when we're studying trends, we rarely see a defeat this absolute. It seems like the tubes have won, none of the customers, no offense, are loyal enough to, to care to go back to a system where they're paying to many different sites for porn. And this tech wave in particular, this disruption, kind of went to MindGeek. Man they won this battle. So the argument would be that the way to reclaim porn content for those who produce it is to look to the next wave, to look at the next tech and the next changes that are coming and get ahead. Because MindGeek now has kind of reached a saturation point and they're not really innovating, they're just sitting comfortably on their monopoly. So one avenue is to make niche content, and we're seeing a lot of this. This is people who create unique brands, whether it's a particular fetish, uh, actors that are exceptionally beautiful, any kind of kink and trend or message that they feel will generate enough loyalty from a small group of the tube viewers to say, you know what, this one thing I'm willing to pay a credit card for, I'm willing to support on a monthly basis, and you're seeing that. You're seeing small flocks migrate away to particular fetish hubs, so you have smaller bubbles surrounding the central bubble. The catch of it is, you still kind of need to use the tube sites to advertise your content so that people become aware that your brand exists, if you're hoping to steal away. The more popular avenue that I'd argue to some degree is stable is webcams. This is where a lot of performers kind of create a stable model. Um, I don't know how popular Uber is in Germany, but it's getting, there. it's getting there, okay. This is the Uber of porn. This is a way for performers or the equivalent of drivers to have a massive network, a support hub, a kind of ranking system. And if you ever go to these tube sites, you'll notice the vast majority of the advertisements are for webcam services. So once you have completely indulged in five masturbation periods and you almost hate yourself and you decide what more could it be that would excite me, the avenue that most people go down that they're willing to actually pay for at a rate of $1.99 a minute sometimes is webcams. There's no piracy. You can't, you can't steal that video stream. It's almost impossible. All the clients are already there on porn sites waiting to connect to the next step. And this next step is engaging to the user because it offers them control, a conversation, an engagement with the performer that isn't just a static stream of someone looking at them. It's something back and forth. And some of the performers we interviewed have said that a not insignificant portion of their clientele barely want something sexual sometimes. They end up just talking with them. They end up engaging in them in a conversation. And it's almost like, sex and therapy is kind of having a crossover point via these electronic eyeballs on top of our computers. We are social creatures, we do seek to bond, and this is an avenue to instantly bond with a complete stranger that may occasionally put something inside themselves. Um, beyond, beyond porn, webcams also probably have the best utility to have sexual education, sexual activism, even a sexual revolution in some countries that have a very theocratic control or restriction on this kind of content, whether it's political, religious, or otherwise, this is a way for people to have an education tool and connect around ideas that aren't often discussed in the public sphere. The other avenue that I think gets most popular is tech innovation. Now, the current trend, if you talk to anyone in tech or porn, is mobile. Everything is Periscope and Snapchat, but you jump four or five years from now and everything's going to be virtual. I'm sure a lot of you know about the Oculus Rift, and there's a lot of other technology that is trying to immerse people in. Whether, and I'm going to murder this word, but it's telodildonics, is a kind of automated dildoing technology that combines with virtual reality so that you can fuck electronics while watching porn virtually. I think that's still a couple of years away. But these are the research fields where people are trying to think if the tube war is lost to tube sites, how can I create content that will cater to the virtual reality future? Now that might mean virtual orgies with digital avatars like cartoons that you're just watching, or it might mean the Oculus orgy image that you see right here where you're watching POV porn and kind of being more immersed into it because everywhere you look, you're in the scene rather than watching a 2D screen in front of you. Uh, and if current stats are anything to go by, we're probably all gonna be doing this for about 38% of our time. 
Um, the danger of this from uh, a psychologist I spoke to is new stigmas and no, new social discussions regarding human sexuality. There are currently already fields of psychological study devoted to masturbation addiction, which is I'm sure something no one in this room suffers from. But a lot of people have found that with the abundance of the internet, you can kind of get that mouse clicking syndrome where you just constantly, it's the junk food of sex. Instead of something prolonged, like you said, with stories or engaging with people in a long way, a lot of people just fast forward to the part that works for them, click it, do their business, and half an hour later, maybe finding themselves doing it all over again. Uh, another avenue I think that needs to be really invested in, and this touches upon what you said, is the idea of acceptance, idea of fighting these social stigmas and bringing porn out of the shadows to rebrand itself. Um, there's a lot of utility in pornography, or at least changing the idea of what we think of as pornography, adult erotica, uh, to make it a tool of sexual education, fighting gender issues, sexual stigmas. There's a lady, actually, Make Love Not War is Cindy Gallup. It's this wonderful, it's what? Sorry, uh, make, make Love Not Porn, you're right. Uh, it's Cindy Gallup. Uh, she creates this wonderful website, which is a tool for sexual education using adult content, using erotica. She engages adolescents sometimes about misconceptions they might have about sexuality, expectations, pressures, what society tells us and why they might be misleading. But she does it in a fun way that caters to this kind of hunger we have for fetishism and erotica, but not in the typical automated way we've seen from very commercialized sex. Now, the best avenue, I think, to challenge that stigma is advertising. And this is one of the most fascinating fields with porn because it's one of the least touch upon. There's a great opportunity to steal some of the money from these tube enterprises and create really interesting dynamics in advertising with pornography. Now you can do sponsored content and I put two brands here, Monster Energy Drink and Lynx Body Spray. I again don't know if these are unique to America or international, but um, they're brands that kind of tantalize and cater to the teenage hormone crowd and they don't mind having a very heavy sexy tone in their advertising. There's no reason that a porn production company can't integrate sponsored content into the show. After an orgy, maybe use a particular kind of deodorant to get the smell off or get an energy drink to recharge yourself after a particularly sexual moment. There are brands that would consider joining in this kind of production when they realize the amount of dedicated audiences and demographics that are in these, uh, watching these videos. Now, the banner ad dynamic is the one place where this is being tested. And there's a company in America called Eat24. They deliver food to you 24 hours a day, simple click of a few mouses, uh, a simple mouse click on your computer, you can get almost anything that's open. Cities like New York, Boston, San Francisco, that gives you a lot of food options. And what they realized is that most of the ads you see are this, you know, this pill will make you the size of an elephant. And instead they wanted to bring something like this. Would you like a BLT with your BDSM? And the way they did it is they studied what's unique about the porn industry. So porn sites feature in the top 100 sites that are visited online. Up there with Google, Facebook, news sites, they get just as many visitors. But CPM, the amount of money you pay to advertise on them, is a tenth of what you would on Google or Facebook. So if I want to put a banner ad on Facebook, which I'm sure most Facebook users will agree are generally ignored, I'm paying an insane premium. But if I want to put a banner ad on a porn site, which I know has people spending a good amount of time on it, I pay almost nothing. So it created a great opportunity for them to think what kind of advertisements can we make for this 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. crowd of porn surfers. And this is what they came up with. Um, the I want to be inside you sub, eat me, fuck pants, stay at home and get delivery. And they placed it and it had insane success, much bigger than they expected. And beyond just being a good advertising return where they invested you know, very cheaply and made an insane amount of money, what they also did was study the trends in when people masturbate, what they order, what regions, and they got insane data on it. Now look, New York City, where I live, apparently we like a powerful lunch break. We like to jerk it and then order something satisfying right after lunch. In, in Houston, Texas, you'll find that people like an early morning wake up. So they're more the morning crowd. They'll jerk off and then order something dramatic to follow. On the other map, you'll see what people order by city most commonly. 
So if you're in Miami and you've just masturbated, apparently a pepperoni pizza is the most satisfying thing that can follow. And in Seattle, a very rainy city, Pad Thai is what hits the spot. So these are interesting data sets that, again, are studied by almost no one and really should be because, as we said, whether you admit it or not, we spend a significant amount of our time engaged with this content. The other, the other model that I'd like to advocate, um, from my experience, I think works best, is a universal subscription. Porn isn't the only industry that was disrupted by the internet. We had the movies, music, and to even my industry, the news, we're still struggling to find a way to monetize that business. But universal subscriptions have been proven to work as a huge challenge to piracy, whether it's Netflix or Spotify. If you tell a user, pay this one monthly fee, $10, $15 a month, and I will give you access to everything, all the best stuff in one place, there's a massive absorption rate of users. It hasn't been attempted in porn because the tube sites are essentially doing that, but they're doing that where no pay and most of the clips are low quality, short clips, snippets, and it's more abundance than anything really sincere and innovative. So if the porn community, the producers who are left, the ones who haven't given up, unite together and make their own brand of a universal subscription, there's a solid chance that they could get a nice chunk of the users who don't want to use Pornhub which also has some inherent kind of tracking and cookies and other aspects that might make people uncomfortable with their privacy. You can also offer users a lot of personalization like you find in Netflix and Spotify. You can give them their favorite videos or recommendations of what they liked based on what they watched. They could share it to Facebook if they really want to. Um, or they could buy exclusive clips, support particular actresses, uh, engage in the content in a more kind of honest way economically. I think if we look back, porn was profitable because to some degree it was a black market, but now it's the mainstream. And if you're the mainstream, you have to think like Coca-Cola. You have to approach it from a business standpoint. And the best analogy I can think of is Thomas Edison uh, during the advent of filmmaking. Thomas Edison has a mixed reputation in history, but he was a tyrant when it came to patents. Any patent he owned, he would pretty much bleed people dry money-wise to, to let them use these patents. And he patented one of the early cameras. So filmmakers didn't actually have to just pay him a patent for the purchase of the camera. They also had to pay him patents just to make a film. And that was strangling a lot of the people who just wanted to be filmmakers in the early days. And what it led to was a lot of people fleeing the East Coast for California, the Wild West of filmmaking. And those Wild West entrepreneurs became Hollywood. They went from pirates to becoming the biggest conglomerates on the planet. And that transformation, although very rapid in the last couple of years, um, has to kind of, is what porn has to deal with right now. Um, I think we can't rely on user loyalty. Uh, technology and sexuality are only going to become increasingly interwoven with each other. So we really have to decide what kind of relationship we want to have with our sex and our tech, or we can go outside and enjoy nature instead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. It was very enjoyable. So uh, now we have a double presentation. That sounds like a double penetration, but I didn't want to tell that. <laughs> a double presentation by uh, 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 Liad Hussein Kantarovic and uh, P.G. Machotti together, because in their different ways, they both work on sex workers, right? And, uh, but let me introduce them better. Uh, Liad Hussein Kantarovic is a performance and activist from Israel-Palestine. And she is one of the founders of the first Middle Eastern queer community and the first outed spokesperson for sex workers' rights in Israel. She studied gender and Middle East history at the Tel Aviv University and worked as a writer focusing on minority issues and grassroots struggles before transitioning to performance art. Her performances focus on de-exotifying and demystifying the positions of those considered sexual or political deviants. She performed extensively in Israel and Palestine and in Berlin, where now she lives. While P.G. Machotti is a researcher and a sex worker rights consultant, uh, advocate and activist that currently is working as a health advisor, outreach and peer education consultant at Hydra in Berlin. PG is active at the European level, being a founding member of Xtalk in London and co-convener of the International Committee for the Rights of the Sex Workers in Europe. 
Her PhD in politics and international studies focused on migrants, transformative politics, and self-organization, including migrant sex workers. So, yeah. So uh, the convention uh, team here is a different form of online sex work. How those changed with the development of the internet and the implication of such changes on the working condition of sex workers as well as the possibility for social and political networking among them. So I uh, leave you the mic to speak out loud, yeah? <laughs> right, hello. Um, so, introducing our topic. The internet, as we know, has become fundamental within the organization, the reshaping and the distribution of sex work. But concretely, we want to ask, in what forms does the internet influence, mediate, facilitate, and enable different ways of making a living through selling sex? And what are the consequences for the working conditions and sustainability of sex workers? So in order to answer these, quest these questions, we would like to first give you an approximate overview of the most common and widespread forms of uh, sex work connected and mediated by the internet. Then uh, we will go into some positive and negative aspects linked to the internet for the working conditions within an organization of sex work. And finally, we will attempt an answer to the returning question. To what extent is the internet a space for the improvement of the lives and sustainability of sex workers under capitalism? So, while we, whilst we will return to forms of sex work taking place strictly online, we would like to first remind of how the internet has become an essential platform from which to advertise any form of sexual services, and of how online and real-life sex work are very often interlinked and serve each other. So, the sex industry is widely advertised online, including classic uh, venues such as brothels and strip clubs, as well as escort agencies, which um, actually boomed also through the internet. Thank you. Um, where am I? Yes. Um, and which range from high class to bargain ones, happy hour ones even. So, um, moreover, the internet <laughs> allowed the advertisement and expansions of forms of independent sex work, ranging from so-called professional independent escorts with own businesses, in-call facilities and websites, to more amateur-style side jobs escorts, and we spoke about it before, who advertise on um, sex portals as, for example, hobby sex workers. So, funnily enough, um, it is probably, probably one surprise that the internet is also being used to promote and advertise most classic forms of sex work, including street sex work. This is, um, this, I don't know if you can read it, but it's like uh, places where street sex work takes place in Berlin, and even caravans. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So finally, in Germany in particular, in particular, it's also common to find websites on which all of these and more expressions of the sex industry are advertised altogether. So as we know, the internet does not only serve as a replacement for flyering or for local paper back page insertions. Sex work is also based on the internet and it is used as much as a different separate option to real life, quote, sexual services, as it is one extra way of making money or recruiting clients, as you mentioned before. So one clear example is um, some websites on which escorts advertise to find clients, but also at the same time offer live chats, phone sex, and webcam in sessions. So what about online sex work? Well. Uh, there's obviously online sex work. Under this, we mainly understand erotic webcam work. Instead of merely describing what's available now, it would be important to summarize the history of webcam work in order to analyze at a later stage the negative and positive consequences on sex workers' working conditions. So here are some historical elements in the evolution of erotic webcam sites. 
Um, they started out in the 1990s as a physical workplace that women would go to and work in existing rooms, generally in shifts in front of cameras. That means that women would have to be in the same city as the company and uh, the, the same physical workspace. Obviously, not that many companies and not that many workers existed at that time. The chat rooms would generally consist of one woman, woman working in front of many online clients, so there would be no private, what's called today, one-on-one -on -one chats. Um, at that time, these sort of chat rooms were conflated with peep shows or strip clubs, so that would mean a single performer in front of an audience. Uh, as technology became more prevalent, more erotic webcam sites popped up that were generated in different places in the world. By 2005, most of the work online was per shift with an hourly wage and in front of a public of viewers with some opportunity to go into quote-unquote private chats one-on-one -on -one, um, that, um, that were uh, for a pay-by-the-minute setup. With the proliferation of home computers, home webcams, laptops, and fast internet connections, more and more people started being able to do erotic online labor from home. So online companies cut their overhead costs and increased their income. They stopped providing the physical infrastructures like the room, the computer, and the internet connection, which were now cared for by each individual worker, and started providing only two essential services. The first was advertising, serving as a central portal that provides mediation between the clients and sex workers. And the second was technological support and assistance from working from home. As sexual images became more prevalent, their overall value went down. So as a result, the industry was shifting to placing higher value on an intimate, personalized, one-on-one -on -one online show customized to the client. This was already discussed here. Um, today, webcam workers mainly make money from one-to-one -one private chats and what's called the group show, or performing in front of, as compared to a group show, which was what was done before, or performing in front of a group audience uh, for money, as this hardly exists. So what are the effects of the internet on the lives and working conditions of sex workers in general? Um, so whilst time limitations make it impossible to address all consequences, we would like to point at at least a few. But for the sake of clarity, we are going to focus on three categories that elucidate how the internet interacts with sex work and in what context. So these categories are interconnected, partially overlapping, and not clear-cut. And we, um, we divided them into uh, services and sexual practices, which I'm going to talk about now, technology and capitalism. So, services and sexual practices. First of all, the internet has led to both the multiplication and, diversif and diversification of sexual services available, and to the increased accessibility to ever more explicit sexual images, as we heard enough today, or not enough, maybe, um, videos and information about sexual practices. So the way porn is widely accessible and free of charge not only leads to a demand for ever more extreme or sophisticated HD quality imagery, but also arguably shapes, to an extent, the desire and expectation of the average client of, sex, of sexual services, who is much more savvy and demanding services in relation to what he is used to seeing on the internet. So this reflects onto the embodied sex industry with sexual services like gangbangs, oral without protection, and even bareback being increasingly demanded and, and offered. So, and this means that the power of definition by sex workers over which safer or less physically demanding services they offer is to an, ex to an extent restricted by the, quote, sexual education that potential clients get online. So the wish to see and experience more also led to an ex increased pressure to show pictures with recognize recognizable faces on them, and for example, it was us covering the eyes on the slides that we showed um, to protect the anonymity of the women. It was not the, on the website they were showing. And this proves pretty problematic for the safeguard of sex workers' anonymity and protection from unwanted outings. These outings can be particularly harmful before, because of the existing social stigma and discrimination against sex workers. So whilst at its beginning, online-based sex work may have allowed more people to engage in sex work protecting their anonymity, showing it all as it is now uh, means that the vastness of the web remains the only hope for some uh, not to be found out. 
So here, here are some examples of the implications of the changing sexual imageries and practices, both paid and unpaid, on webcam work. So first of all, working in HD essentially means working harder and setting some competition apart between sex workers or professionals who are prepared to show it all and quote-unquote amateurs who don't. People want close-ups of double penetration, for instance, things that in the past could easily be faked because the camera wasn't so clear. Whereas now, it's no longer an option to fake it. Um, as for the non-virtual sex worker, the increase of visual knowledge through technology leads the webcam worker to have to perform more explicitly and graphically. Uh, the prevalence and bombardment of sexual images in communication online has particularly influenced the work of web sex workers as they need to set themselves as professionals and apart from the quote-unquote amateur participants in free chats and to provide clients with what they can't get anywhere else for free. So clients have gotten accustomed to asking for crazier things, also things that they wouldn't ask for in real life. The screen, which mediates between the two sides, bring more distance and enables clients to ask for unrealistic things from workers, so more so than before. Again, the webcam workers, it means for them that they have to work harder. Um, one way of showing that you're a professional is to show your face, which is a demand which is on the rise in the last several years and applies also to real-life sex workers. Showing faces uh, gives a client more of a personalized perspective on the worker, but let us not forget that webcam work is also sex work, which is stigmatized work. Workers who work at large international sites or ones from bigger countries where there is more traffic also feel this pressure. So this you see from a large site, for instance, where if you just enter their page, everyone has to show their faces and uh, is fully exposed right on top. This is a German site, so, so not an international one, it's slightly smaller, and a few of the workers are choosing to show their face, and some of them work more anon anon anonymously. And thirdly, this is an Israeli site, so in a much smaller country, uh, also more stigmatized uh, and more anonymous, and as you see, no one is showing their faces. Another effect is that clients of smaller or country-based webcam sites, such as this one in particular, are, are seeing the sites as hookup or meeting sites. So the how can I meet you question has always occurred, but um, it has now become so prevalent and almost expected that most clients would ask that. So if the sex worker answers with, you can't meet me, the online chat is over. Um, as compared to previous years, clients do know that they are meeting a sex worker online and not a volunteer-based amateur, so more and more the conversation is geared towards buying real sex, as compared to virtual sex, for money, whereas before this request, this request to meet could also have been implied unpaid sex. This is a positive and negative implications for the workers. Uh, positive, if you're a hooker, this is a great opportunity for you to advertise your services for free, meet potential clients, screen them, and make extra money from the webcam. If webcamming, however, is your predominant form of income and you have no intention to do live sex work, your financial opportunities are actually shrinking. So clients raise knowledgeability of the monetary implication of specific, specific sexual encounters mediated by the internet is also to be, find, to be found within real life sex work. It has become actually known that people advertising on specific sites are sex workers and therefore they are to be paid for their services. And it is even becoming commonly understood that the transaction has to take place in advance upon meeting her or him. This is happening despite the fact that many sex workers do advertise as amateurs or doing it as a hobby or passion. To an extent, it has become accepted amongst clients that taking the money for it does not reduce the willingness, quote, or genuineness of the sexual involvement of the worker. And this can be surely seen as a positive element for the worker's uh, safeguard of income and of time. However, the internet as a means and platform for sharing information, setting trends and standards, as we saw with the first presentation, has got further, at times, ambivalent consequences that we will now go on to analyze under the category of technology. So, technology. For what webcam work is concerned, things like a computer, a camera, and a fast connection are now relatively cheap, and so more people have access to work from home, but, uh, but they do have to take care of all their means of production. To stay on top of the game, the sex worker needs to continuously pay for things that set her apart from the non-paid amateur uh, chat participants. 
Before it was a move from typing in the chat to getting a microphone, and now, for instance, it's working in HD. Uh, technology made things also much faster, and for webcam sex workers, that means a loss of money. At webcam sites, women get paid by the minute. Previously, clients and sex workers had to type and coordinate between performing or masturbating and typing. Clients also had more patience, so each private show would last longer, hence the sex worker would make more money. Today, all private shows are much shorter, and the client, uh, once a client pays, there's a demand to quote-unquote get to the point, so the sex worker essentially makes less. To offset the losses, some technological advancements have been used to implement new goods and services to sell, and they have also been partially discussed here. Uh, for instance, charging clients money to send private messages uh, to webcam workers through the site, or sex workers creating videos and selling them to to clients through webcam sites. Um, also, some sites all, all offer clients an ability to passively peek into a one-on-one -on -one private show that is happening while remaining invisible. So I would be doing a performance for a client, I would be getting money from that client, but other clients could also be watching without knowing and then also be getting money from them. So generally, the internet can be seen as providing a consistent part of sex workers with the means to work and advertise independently online, to work from home, even if it's just for advertising, screening clients um, and communicating, and to increase their income generating activities by multiplying the platforms and means to sell services. So with phone, chat, webcams, advertising on a variety of different portals and platforms, for instance. However, the displacement of sex work from physical spaces to virtual ones can also have downsides. And these are mainly given by the isolation which independent sex workers or those using the services of an online based, uh, online -based agency or webcam site experience in their work life. Sex workers who use the internet to work do not share a physical workspace with other colleagues, meaning they are mainly alone whilst communicating with and screening clients and have no access to live peer support, knowledge sharing, or to learning tips and tricks uh, from fellow workers. And important here is to remember, and fortunately it's been said before, that sex work is um, a highly stigmatized activity. And this bears a complex array of consequences which cannot at all, all be inspected here, but which definitely make a case for the need for a community of friends and fellow workers to talk to. For supporting in dealing with the stigma, for self-empowerment, for self-care, for networking, and also for organizing pol politically. So, on the other hand, in this respect, even if physical presence is lacking, the internet has actually exactly become the site for forums, networking and mobilizing. And sex workers are connecting with each other, accessing information of safer work, for instance, on available service providers, um, and even lists of bad clients to be avoided. So in terms of organizing for one's rights, Parts of the uh, sex workers' rights movement is actually active re actively recruiting and using social networks, um, listservs and websites to communicate, connect and mobilize. However, it is important to remark that to access such networking requires the knowledge of the national language used, for example, for German forums, German, and certain technological skills. And this can be a limitation for those many sex workers whose online presence is mostly mediated by agency or third parties, and who therefore do not have access to networking and, uh, um, and still fully experience the isolation of internet-based sex work. So, the flow of information that on the one hand strengthens the capacity of some sex workers to get knowledgeable, unite and connect with each other, also allows clients to communicate with each other, or, the, or, or the, um, to, to monitor, to evaluate, to comment on, and to rate, sorry, oh, I missed one, and to rate, um, where are you now, what are you doing, yeah, no, why are you doing that, I was going to do, yeah, right, and even to rate sex workers. Um, these forums risk delivering clients problematic powers over the sex workers. 
as bad ratings can really ruin your business. And some clients um, have been reported by sex workers to blackmail them and, and threaten to write bad ratings if they were not to accomplish their wishes. And finally, it's, as we see, not, um, unfortunately not uncommon to find insulting language on such forums. On the other hand, we also have client networks, like for instance, Freier Sein, which means being a John, being a Panta, that promote respectful and fair business with sex workers. So, importantly, the internet does enable the multiplication of different voices also of sex workers themselves and narratives about what sex work is and who sex workers are. Let's think, for instance, um, of existing blogs by sex workers themselves. And this plays a very important role, um, as you mentioned before, um, in ending and defying the simplistic, demoralizing or victimizing stigma that affects sex workers. And it can and does reach wide audiences and contributes to phenomena such as the sh shortly mentioned uh, Fair Client Forum. So we will now analyze the impact of the internet on sex workers' working conditions within capitalism, keeping in mind that it's quite congruent to the way that the work market in general has been affected in the past 15 years of internet. Um, so, about capitalism. As far as webcamming is concerned, the proliferation of sites allowed more women to work online, but overall lowered their working conditions. Whereas until about 2005, women predominantly were paid by the hour and treated as employees, they are now freelance workers without any workers' rights aside from the money they make. They are now getting paid by the minute based on however many clients they manage to attract. So their income is also insecure and precarious. On these sites, the women make anywhere between 25 to 50 percent of what the clients pay. One of the more disturbing economic tendencies in the webcam market is the rise of the middleman companies, as we call them. Let's say, for instance, that you would like to work online, but you don't have your own means of production, you don't have language skills, or you don't have the technological know-how. There are plenty of smaller companies who would provide you with a computer, a connection, a workplace, and an online profile, and connect you to one of the pre-existing large international online webcam sites. In return, they will collect 50% of your share of the earnings. So that's 50% to the large webcam company, 25% to the middleman company, and 25% to the worker. Needless to to say it is the poorest and most technologically and culturally disadvantaged sex workers who work under such conditions. So as, privileged, as previously mentioned, many sex workers now own the means of advertising and of production and become independent workers. So while this is a definitive improvement in comparison to the precarious and very criminalized forms of sex work previous and unfortunately still happening previous to the internet though, um, it still results in other forms of precarity linked to the general increase of self-employment in contemporary capitalist development. Freelancing, indeed, brings uncertainty on, of income in the best cases, a total lack of social security and health insurance in the worst cases, and precarity in most, mostly all of them, nearly. This is also definitely true for sex workers, in the real um, as much as in the virtual labor market. Moreover, an equivalent to the middleman in the internet-based uh, uh, real-life sex work is the escort agency, which takes between 40 and 60 percent of the whole earning from one booking of the sex workers. And although being in an agency does give you more of a likelihood of income, it's, it still is a freelance activity and it provides no security whatsoever. So apart from agencies, also middlemen can be single individuals who manage individual sex workers' insertions and profiles, who do the communication for them and they chat with clients pretending to be them and get varying percentages of the escorts earning for doing it. So whilst it can make sense for some escorts uh, to delegate the hassle of communicating with clients, which amounts to unpaid recruitment work with a considerable number of uh, time wasters, it is not uncommon, unfortunately, that those sex workers with less technological or language skills, that is, those who need to delegate, end up being, who need to delegate, um, they end up being uh, ripped off by their middlemen. 
Just like anywhere else in the business market, the popularity and rise of webcam chat sites did eventually lead to a phenomenon where a few larger international sites swallow a large number of the percentage of the market share and the workers. Alongside them are smaller national-based or niche-based webcam sites that provide services in languages that aren't English. As a competition in this field has grown, so has a demand to provide more and more services for free. This occurs particularly at the large international sites. On those sites, the workers have to conduct free chats with live video stream to non-paying clients with no financial compensation. The workers use the free chat to try to lure clients to enter the private chats and pay, but it means that they are in, in effect performing non-stop as long as they work without earnings. So just as instance here, we, didn't, we just did a screenshot instead of a video, but as you see, you just click it on, this woman is already performing, and on the right uh, bottom side of the screen is the chat that she is conducting with clients. So she is doing this for free, whereas before, you would have to pay money before you actually got uh, to this part and to seeing her. Um, with more sites, there are more options of workplaces. So if a worker doesn't like a particular site, you can always go to another. Uh, sex workers do have some choice between large sites with more unpaid labor in the form of free chats, but with higher wages per minute in which they have to reveal their faces on one hand, and smaller sites where they make less money per minute, but maybe not have to provide free services such as this and not have to reveal their faces. In light of the explosion of big companies and big money, it is noteworthy to mention that certain capitalist advancements have at the same time aided some sex workers seize back their own agency and their own means of production. One example of this is Skype. Uh, more and more sex workers are registering their services on free amateur paid sites, such as this one, or independent general sites like Craigslist or eBay Kleinanzeige here in Germany, where they advertise their services and lead potential clients to pay them through PayPal. So here, just what you see with the arrow is that this woman is saying, I'm, I'm doing the chat, but go to PayPal, pay me 30 euros, and then I'll be there and waiting for you. Uh, the webcam... Um, the private webcam show is conducted through Skype and without the use of a webcam site that takes 50% of the worker's income. Another example is the use of social media. Sex workers open a Facebook or a Twitter account based on their online personality and use it to attract clients. That way they're not entirely dependent on the webcam sites for clients and if they want to leave the site and go to work at another site, uh, through their online social media profile their clients can continue to find them. In other words, social media sites help these sex workers become more independent and less re reliant on the websites that employ them. With the relative benefits um, that the economic changes affords workers of the sex industry, it is also important to note that not all sex workers can reap those benefits. Agency, autonomy, more choices, and relative independence on online work relies first and foremost on one's web and tech-savvy skills, marketing skills, access to technology, and language skills. And those are all very class-based indicators. So, what do we think the potentials and limitations of the internet are for sex workers' working conditions and sustainability within capitalism? We got to the conclusions. We would like to conclude by suggesting that sex work is a means to, through which a number of people, large, uh, attempt to take economic advantage out of the sexist, homo and transphobic structures that seek to reduce some of us, that is, cis women and non-heteronormative subjects, to our sexuality. The stigma which affects sex workers can be interpreted as a further normalizing and moralizing social mechanism to keep us from gaining too much economic empowerment and social acceptance, hence to keep the social order as it is. So within this context, the internet does allow more sex workers to advertise, to work independently and to make money. Moreover, through enabling the mushrooming of different narratives about sex work by sex workers themselves, the internet strongly aids the crucial fight against mon moralizing, monothematic and stigmatizing views on sex workers and on sex work. However, we should not forget that we live under capitalism, we said it enough. And therefore, <laughs> the access to the internet or to the skills and means necessary to make use of it are still strongly mediated by inequalities along the lines of class, gender, 
race, legal status, and so on. So we believe one crucial way to improve sex workers' lives and working conditions, as much as those of the general population, uh, world population, is to spread and foster the skills and means to access the internet, definitely. However, this will not happen if inequalities of class, gender, migratory or ethnic backgrounds, and so on, are not tackled at the same time. As these are what, at the end of the day, determines people's access to the internet, whether doing sex work or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. So I, uh, I will try to gather some inputs that I had from uh, the wall of you. And uh, I wanted to start uh, uh, with Nishan. It's, your presentation was very good. Um, and uh, speaking about uh, using pornography to understand the mechanism of regulation, I think that in relationship to, uh, to tubes, uh, like we at different moments, because uh, in, in relationship to porn tubes, for example, the experience of X-tube was very different in relationship to uh, tubes like U-porn uh, or the red tube uh, and so on, because X-tube, uh, even though it's part of Manwin 2, I think, uh, in terms of providing, um, it was really a social network. I mean, it was people registering there, opening a profile, uh, uploading videos, making friends, making groups, uploading photos. So what happened there was an anthropological mechanism of uh, reconstruction of what was real core. Like there's somebody there that is uploading uh, pictures and videos. This means it's real, you know? But that was the marketing strategy of the platform itself, in a way, you know? Because uh, there, is, there is people, people are uploading their pornography, so I'm going there because, uh, for me, pornography and transgression is getting in touch with the, the realness of the experience. But then, slowly, we pass through a, a model of a porn tube where the human element faded away, slowly, until the point where what is interesting, and it's relating with what you're saying, uh, uh, in a moment of uh, hyper-exposition of uh, video and picture, subtraction becomes the transgression, you know? So subtraction becomes the mechanism of regulation, in a way. So uh, if we have to think about pornography as a subtraction and subtraction as a mechanism of regulation, how would we develop a methodology out of that? You want an answer now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that sounds like a PhD thesis that five people should be doing. Um, but I, I do think there's some, I, I, I take everything that you take into account, but I think uh, it's not merely about what are the new kinds of safeguards that we need for older kind of porn, but that what are the new kinds of pornographic products, bodies, and objects which are being produced which are not recognized as porn and hence completely slip under every kind of protection that we could provide, right? So historically, we've fought very long, for example, to say that porn performers are performers and not sex workers. We've made that distinction. We've reached a point where we're actually conflating it all over again and saying that, but there doesn't seem to be a very easy line about what is pornography and what is sex work, right? But outside of the official channels of sex work, there is still an incredible amount of material which does not get the kind of protection either in terms of intellectual property, in terms of ownership, in terms of privacy, on the fact that uh, the women that you showed whose faces might not be shown on the Israel sex work site, that does not happen when teenagers are sexting with each other. That's not even an option, right? So how do you even start re realizing these new kinds of intersections. For example, it's funny that something like the Amanda Todd case should happen in Canada when Canada has been on the forefront of fighting for one of the most progressive privacy right. policies online, including the right to be forgotten, mm. right? But so how do we kind of bring the notions of the pornographic, the sex worker, and the body back into these debates, which are not merely digital debates, but have very real life repercussions, is something that we're kind of interested in. 
Yeah, I'm totally, I'm totally uh, agree, and it's even like uh, an anthropological changing of the sexual experience in a way, you know, because uh, the, the, the consumer that uh, crosses this platform completely changed uh, the way he self-produces orgasm through masturbation, because you're having clips that are going from like uh, one minute to five minutes, and you have to reach the orgasm in this range of time, and you don't have the construction of the narrative as you were saying before. You just have the moment of the penetration, you know? So you have to prepare yourself to that moment, then watch the video by knowing that it's going to last five minutes and jerk off and have an orgasm in this arch. So I think that the relationship with the, the question of methodology is even the relationship between the question of how to change the sexual experience online, in a way, I think. Can I just add a very little bit, saying that I'm also very concerned by the hyper-masculine spectator that we imagine for pornography? Like, even in the ways in you are narrating it, is it as if only there is a certain kind of a male perf uh, audience mm -hmm. that is being imagined? And mm -hmm. I think this dislocation is necessary yeah. um, to kind of just look at the ways in which gender is going to play a role in reconceptualizing the spectator um, might not necessarily come from gender politics, but my proposition is will come from digital rights politics. And digital it might what? Be digital rights okay. politics. And it would be an interesting conflation to make at that point. Oh, yeah. And then, um, speaking about your presentation, um, what uh, I thought is that a, a second step about porn tubes um, like crossing through this idea of social networking as a new construction of real core and going uh, uh, faster and faster just to the uploading uh, of pirates video, what happened in the contemporary uh, porn tubes is that you go on a, on a porn tube, you click and you don't see the video, but it, uh, it brings you to another porn tube. You click on the video and it brings you to another porn tube. So what's happening is double level to me. So from one part, it's like what you say, like bringing the consumer inside the, the, the mega platform and selling banners, you know? And, uh, uh, and I think, you know, that this is exactly the new business model, in a way, of the porn tube as mega pet platform of the convergence of different tubes. Together. Uh, I think there's a pretty simple and greedy reason why that mechanism exists. Uh, there's several sites you can actually visit now where it looks like it's an article that says, you know, top 13 reasons why this cat looks like you or something stupid. And instead of all being on one page, it'll be one item, click next page. And it's simply accruing page views because that is the simple mechanism that we're still measuring advertising revenue by. The argument being the more time someone spends here, the more time they look at this page, the more likely they are to see your advertisement. And, in, and this has been the philosophy since we invented billboards. I drive by and I see a commercial for some product. Maybe I don't buy it right away, but it left an impression. And then six months later, when I find myself in the supermarket, that's the product I'm going to buy. And I don't know that we can actually prove that. I'm not familiar with marketing statistics, but that's what websites are built on. And sending you down that rabbit hole loop of like, you clicked here, but you ended up here, you ended up here, you ended up here, means that 10 sites benefited from exactly. one click. And they all get to share in this idea that we all bring audiences here, we all have eyeballs here. Now, to the point about, you said, X tube versus other tubes, a lot of those were in experimentations in what would get the most popular. Do we want a Facebook of sex where we all have our profile and identity, or do we want anonymity? Do we want something that looks like YouTube and it's you porn, or do we want something that's a bit more you know, grungy and sexual and edgy? And that's why ManGeek doesn't just have one website, it has a hundred. And each one has a thematic difference or distinction, whether it's branding or erotica, to make people feel like there's a diversity out there that's all funneling into the same company. Yeah, I totally agree, and I think that there are uh, two other things to discuss. I think that this mechanism of uh, like uh, being pushed from one term tube platform to another relates even to the desire of cruising, uh, which is a contemporary uh, video uh, digital experience. You know, it's like you're going to Netflix, you know, mm -hmm. and you just cruise the titles. Yeah. You know, it's not that you're choosing to real to absorb the content. Just yeah. going on and on and on. And this is what the, the contemporary post-digital sexual desire is about to me, you know? Mm. Even like this researching the obscene as a DIY agency outside big data capitalism. Mm. This is a typical trace 
of, uh, of um, the, the, the post-digital moment? Well, I think there's actually, that's actually an opportunity for returning to pure porn or porn producers who create something because there's a psychological effect that happens to people when they're spoiled with too much choice. If there's too much abundance, it almost freezes them. Yeah. There's a very famous restaurant chain in America called Cheesecake Factory, and they have a 60-page menu. It's absurd. Their kitchen is the size of this church. Wow. And you can order anything and everything, but what most people do is after they've been there once, they remember the one thing they enjoy and they just order it again because you can't be conflicted between, it's hard enough when you say the metaphor of I had two paths to choose from. If you have 500 paths to choose from, you can't devote enough of your cerebral like, uh, cognitive decision making to think that any one of them is worth it because you have this hysteria that you've lost out on 499 opportunities. So I think with porn, when you're having like, the tube sites are built on this, we'll give you everything and everything and it's chaotic, but when you get these niche sites, their advantage is we give you one thing purely, executed beautifully in HD and the noise is over there. And it won't get everyone, but it'll get people who are interested. And yeah, totally. And then, you know, I mean, this process of cruising, it's the perfect space of the bombing of banners of sex workers, you know? Uh, but one thing that really touched me in relationship, just visually speaking, in relationship to the slides that you show, is that they were all white, in a way, you know? Like, well, there was not a racial uh, element inside it. Um, well, first of all, there were. We, we, somehow we, we managed to take those out. One of the women who had her eyes uh, were Asian. I right. wouldn't call that really white. Um, that's a good question. And perhaps in a way that does show who works online. I mean, I cannot comment on that, but I have seen plenty. There's a lot of things that we particularly chose not to show because we felt that it would be compromising the workers. Like, they're out there already in a lot of these sites, essentially, as we said, working for free. They're putting their images out for free. You click on it. You already see the woman working working for free, and we didn't want to, we're not paying them, so we didn't want to, to show them, so in order to, um, to not compromise them more in our uh, take on it, we decided to, uh, we decided to delete that. Okay. No, I just wanted to say that that was a good remark, although as um, Liad said, one, one of the women was, like, was Asian, but it's definitely the case that the normal average sex worker looked for is white. It's, it reflects uh, racist uh, um, relations in society. And if you, there are a lot of exoticizing websites, but they're like more specified and we wouldn't want, we wouldn't want, did, we didn't want to go there and, you know, go to the specific Asian only or black women or I don't know, but it's more specified. It's because we live in a white supremacy. So, yeah. Can, can I ask, out of, out of curiosity, do you know the demographics of the viewers, what countries they come right. from, the advantage? Is, it, are, is there a huge African, Asian, or otherwise presence of the people who are viewing the content? Um, that's a great question, and I have to say no. And I think the anonymity of everything and keeping all that information away from you is very important. Like. I would tell you, as somebody who's worked on several of these sites, that when you work on an Israeli site, almost all of your clients are Israeli. When you work on German sites, all of your site, all your clients are uh, German because it is specifically catering to German-speaking ones or ones coming from German-speaking countries. Uh, when you go to uh, a huge site like Live Jasmine, you don't know. But what you also don't know is where the site is from, who is working there, where is it being managed, where is the portal uh, actually at, where is the the salaries coming off. All this information is completely hidden so that uh, neither the, 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 the clients don't have access to, but in our case, we are looking at the sex workers. It keeps them away from knowing, for instance, I don't know, in some cases, how much money the site is making from them. Um, who are the actual bosses? Where do their uh, international and legal standings are in particular to that site? And by keeping that information away, of course, they're having less power. Yeah, um, I, I want to ask you another thing. Uh, for example, when uh, uh, me and Tatiana, we uh, tried to work uh, with Transmedial about this team of porn tubes, maybe it was too premature, you know? But we had a lot of problems, really big problems to relate uh, to Menwin before we had to spot to identify that. So we, we went to a process to understand the property of tubes, and then we arrived to understand that it was a monopole. Then once we understood that there was a monopole there, 
we, we didn't have any access. So I, I was wondering uh, what kind of method uh, did you use to do uh, your inquiry and your research? Well, first of all, welcome to the world of journalism. There's a lot of doors that are slammed in your face and a lot of rejection. Um, but I think at a certain point, if, when we're approaching drug dealers, for instance, uh, if I have to convince a drug dealer whose entire life is illegal and his identity is his biggest thing to protect, that he needs to share his story, he needs to let me film him, that's a huge sales pitch. That requires weeks of trust and establishing, offering them protection. But at the end of the day, they're probably lured by the idea that their voice, their message, would benefit the public, that people should know the reality of what a drug dealer is, and it's not just some thug with a gun, but it's essentially what bootleggers used to be in the 1920s of America when alcohol was illegal. Um, so the problem with men when, unlike the military or politics or anyone else, is they don't benefit at all from interacting with the press. There's nothing that they can gain from talking to the press. The few stories that have been written about them haven't been flattering, and the few times that they've made an attempt to reach out to publications and offer them access, those write-ups have been terrible too because there isn't a single good thing you could say about Manwin. Um, there's just, I'm sorry, but like, no, no, like there isn't anyone who's worked with them, whether, you know, my colleagues who have spoken with porn producers, actors, former employees, like no one has anything good to say about them, but they don't owe anyone an ethical level because they have a monopoly. Right. And in any industry where you'll see a monopoly, whether it's cable service providers or food production, anything where one person has an unholy amount of power, there's very little motivation for them to be accountable unless you have a strong regulator challenging them. Now, porn doesn't have regulators because, as people have mentioned, most credit card companies won't even interact with them. Most you know, of the popular websites like Facebook, Tumblr, uh, Instagram make it e either impossible or very difficult to display erotic material. So there's already this ostracized shunning of pornography into a corner, so no one's really defending them. And they've become too small to defend themselves against the monopoly. So it's a David and Goliath option, but there's nothing that's really going to stop it from being a David and Goliath yes, option. Exactly. And this, is, this relates exactly with, with the keynote, you know, mm. because her strategy was to apply her brand on the video. So when the video is stolen, you can at least, as you said, mm -hmm. do promotion, you know, mm -hmm. and take some of the, like, like outsourcing the mm -hmm. fluxes of information out of this network. Mm -hmm. As you were saying too, for example, like producing a one-to-one -one relationship through Skype and uh, hooking up people in other social media was like bringing this flux of information out and produce a more stable and let's say democratic relationship in a way. Mm -hmm. I would like to open uh, the discussion and to see if somebody of you have uh, any idea, suggestion, uh, uh, perspective uh, uh, about this huge range of themes that we just dealt with. So please. Do you have any uh, idea, any comment, any uh, suggestion? Question? Questions? Questions? <laughs> Simplest? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I break the ice a bit. Yeah. Um, Roy, I wanted to ask you something related to the big monopoly because, uh, you know, it's something we were really into trying to research a lot. And uh, why do you think actually this uh, story that I think is pretty big, because you know we are speaking about a monopoly in the internet that is really controlling a high percentage of traffic, is not so, so much uh, heard around, because uh, initially I've been also doing really huge research to understand who was actually reporting uh, this story, and I came up only with three journalists, including you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I find that it's pretty, uh, surprising because you know I also come from the hacker scene in which people really care about these issues and freedom of speech and so on but really few people speak about this porn monopoly so I wonder if you also have an uh, answer about that. I, I think it's two things uh, I think the first half is stigma uh, not a lot of people have sympathy for porn it's still in this bubble where we we all we all watch it, we all enjoy it. And if you have an adult conversation with someone who's honest with themselves, they'll admit it. But on a social level, we don't talk about it. So when the story I wrote came out uh, about this monopoly existing, that was the headline that engaged people like, oh my God, I didn't know that everything on the internet is owned by one company. And that was enough of a fascination for them to finish their interest. No one thought about what's the justice, what about these porn producers who have been working hard to share something they're passionate about, create erotica, been doing it for 20, 30, 40 years, some of them. No one thought about that aspect because 
the cool of it was that something had been created in a very disruptive manner. And that brings me back to your hacker comment. A lot of the early coverage I did in my career was on anonymous and hackers. And what you find when you interact with these groups long enough is that there's a pretty strong division. Half of these people are the ones promoting tube sites and the idea that everything should be free and inaccessible. And the other half are maybe a bit more pragmatic and realize that this parasitic dynamic can't last forever. You can't have one company v being a vampire and sucking away from all the producers because they will disappear. The producers will disappear and then who's making porn? Like, that pragmatism isn't sexy, it isn't engaging, it doesn't really interest people in journalism, but it's the cold reality. And it's almost like what you see on a grander scale with global warming. We all are aware that something terrible is happening, but no one is quite moving or doing anything about it because it'll figure itself out. Things that aren't directly in our responsibility to affect, it's very hard to motivate people unless you give them a hard, cold solution that says this is how you can fix the problem. Which is why I would say people like Carmen, if you and a hundred other producers of extremely good content of unique niches and fetishes got together and made your own collective, that might be a powerful presence. But that requires a bond of trust between you and a hundred other producers across the world that cater to dedicated audiences. And then instead of stealing a little bit of the tube's audience, you collectively steal a big amount. But that's a very risky, dangerous move. That's and I think that that could work um, on a, a methodology of absence, you know? Like you were speaking about like a constructed uh, niche uh, market, you know? Uh, but in, a, in, a, in an internet of, uh, of, uh, of hyper exposition, uh, as we saw, like subtraction works as plus value in a post digital moment, probably that could be the new obscene in terms of political strategy. Yeah. Reclaim the power. Yeah, reclaim the absence, subtract from the maps, you know, by inform the maps that you're subtracting yourself, yeah. you know. So this to me is the new obscene that can be a political tool. I, I'd agree that the biggest advantage anyone who wants to get into this business or sustain themselves in this business is to be ahead of the next trend. I think yeah. the tubes have won to a large degree in that it's a hurricane and we can try to throw as many stones as we can on the hurricane, or we can create the next hurricane. I mean, but I have to say something to that, and specifically to, from a sex worker perspective, because in thinking about this, I was thinking, well, what about the future, and how can we sustain ourselves? And you know what? We can't exactly for those reasons, because most sex workers are not, in order to be ahead, and in order to think of the next trend, you have to be extremely technologically savvy, and generally have people working for you doing those things, and, you know, most sex workers don't live in Silicon Valley and have a huge amount of salary to do that, and the ones who are are quite on the complete opposite side of that, cannot do that, so they end up running uh, or trying to run after the trends, and the more behind that they are lagging, the less money they are making. Yeah, and this isn't a messiah moment. I think the bottom line is ManGeek owns a multi-billion dollar empire, and no one's expecting you to be a hacker or create the next app, but there are companies in Silicon Valley that want a slice of that pie, and to defeat MindGeek, they will look for people like you to create sure. a collective. So it's a matter of partnership, it's a matter of timing, and it's a matter of connecting you guys, whether it's events like this, networking at other places, a mixture of tech and sex and erotica and other dynamics. Eventually, two people will meet, which will be the catalyst that brings a whole bunch of new people together. I really agree with that. Just a, one more small thing I would like to add, that all this um, sounds <laughs> promising and um, it's possible. Um, but um, what I, what something that really bothers me about sex workers' rights activism as well is the fact that sometimes we forget that um, we can get to a much better, better situation for many sex workers. But if we don't, if we don't fight the hard line, we will always reproduce the same hierarchies that there are in society right now. So there are the few sex workers who will make it to have these, um, you know, the, the new future ideas, and. The, the others, the most of them, are going to remain in the streets or whatever, just in, 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 yeah, in worse conditions. Yeah. So as long as there is a capitalist neoliberal system, there won't be possible. You know, Can to I have just add to that? Because why, right. while I really appreciate the solution that you're offering, which is that the alternative is going to be the space that's going to defeat the main structure, that was 99. 
Right? That was the dream of the web. I mean, when Tim Berners-Lee wrote that wonderful thing called the Worldwide Manifesto, what he really was hoping was that this is what the internet would achieve. It's going to be equality and alternative and everybody's inclusion. I'm sorry, there is, I am discomfort, I have a huge amount of discomfort with the romance in it. Because the minute you say that the alternative space has to be carved out, I guarantee you it's going to be Facebook. And if it's a choice between Facebook and Manvin, I don't think there is much option left there. Yeah, this, because, I, because Tatiana, I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of surprised at why we are surprised that there is a monopoly uh, within the digital services. It's obviously everywhere, right? If you look at the work that Tactical Technologies in uh, Berlin is doing, they've mapped out 396 assets that Alphabet has, one of which is Google, right? And that they govern almost every single domain of our life, including buying neurobiological uh, services, which are now offering that they are going to cure death, because that's a problem, right? Um, so there is a way by which the neoliberal capital is moving towards a monopoly, and that the, that the solution cannot be a romantic alternative, because the alternative space does not exist. In which case, I think occupy, reappropriation, and resistance sometimes gets more cachet for me uh, than finding that alternative space having worked. And that's why I said the digital rights management and the sexual rights management will have to conflate. That we cannot put into the digital technologies the utopia that our existing physical practices cannot afford. And that we might have to work out a better vocabulary of perhaps doing the two together. Just to defend my romantic ideology. <laughs> no, 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 actually, I'm, no, 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 no. I think naive, you found yeah. a wonderful strategy. <laughs> I, I think the issue is when people talk in these absolute terms, it sounds like a light switch. Like, oh, we have the solution, problem over. And the issue is it's usually a progress of many painstaking steps. Uh, Emancipation and Proclamation in America was signed 160 years ago to end slavery, and it was only about 40 years ago that you could argue, or argue that the civil rights movement really you know, catalyzed and we had a, a significant amount of change. Now, to your example of like, I don't think that there's one approach, if you take the Martin Luther King approach of peace or the Malcolm X approach of violent protest, there are many ways to attack this program, uh, problem. And we will see incremental progress. And I think that's the litmus test of whether this problem is being solved. You're right, 1999 dot-com bubble affected a lot of industries. But to be fair, back then we didn't have high-speed video. We didn't have credit card transactions online being as seamless. We didn't have a lot of the texts that I just mentioned that were actually pushed by the porn industry. The porn industry helped credit card transactions online, helped video, helped webcams, helped a wide variety of tech advancements because they were the driving force audience behind them. So when I'm saying porn will help with the next wave, the next hurricane, I'm not saying it'll be easy, I'm saying there is an audience there of millions and millions of people across the world. They spend more than 10 minutes on there. That, from an advertising and a tech point of view, is a demographic that the capitalist machine wants. And the capitalist machine doesn't care about gender, it doesn't care about race, it doesn't care about anything but profit. So the moment porn legitimizes itself as this is an entity that demands billions of dollars, that's when you can start driving the change. And again, slow but steady. Yeah, I totally uh, agree with that, and I, uh, I think that like, the utopic romanticism of being di dialectical against big data capitalism, it's, uh, it's, it's part of big, big data capitalism itself, you know, because as I said before, big data capitalism, it's looking for truth, it's looking for the experience, it's looking for the reality, which is not already uh, absorbed, but as soon as it finds it, it's already part of that. So, uh, what is the strategy in there? How do we infiltrate this mechanism? And what is interesting to me is that like, the pornography of subtraction uh, can be self-managed in a way as a, a method to infiltrate inside this mechanism and produce the balance of powers. But we have to understand how, in a way. So just, I, I completely agree, and seriously, it's not an attack on romanticism. While, you know, as, as academic cynics, we do do that, but I think everybody on the table is also an activist, and we are driven by politics of hope. Um, but just to make sure that the, even the kind of technological romanticism, what it neglects for me, is a huge post-colonial baggage. I'm sorry, no, the alternative for somebody in India who might want to have her career as a sex worker has nothing to do with an alternative space. Uh, it has to do with the fact that Facebook is now introducing something called safe basics as a way of killing net neutrality in that bloody country. 
right? Um, so when you talk about the possibilities of which are the bodies which can afford to have this romantic hope, that's also a very, very small minuscule, which is not necessarily the kind of person who does enter this particular industry of sex work, of pornography production. That uh, there, is a, there might be a certain privilege, James Franco, James Dean kind of an actor who crosses over into every genre and so on and so forth uh, and has now a blog and a fan following and an escort service and possibly owns a couple of things who might be able to do it. But even on a completely different track, right, with the publishing industry, for example, we've seen how any attempt at setting up a collaborative cooperative between independent publishers has largely been struggling. It involves, and I think your work was fantastic for that because it involves so much unpaid and affective labor which gets wiped away as either political solidarity or the work that we have to do uh, and, and there is no way of kind of compensating or even enumerating it. Uh, and that, that needs to be kind of brought back into it. So capitalism does care about race and gender and sexuality and location. It exploits it, it excludes it, and it filters and subtracts it because it's not the one that's going to make it profit. Um, no, I'm d just maybe to, to reiterate your point. When I was looking at this uh, initially and thinking of who are the people in the, within the sex industry who set, uh, who were maybe not today, but who were innovators in the time or in the time that the internet started, uh, there are people who started their own uh, multiple channel uh, websites in which they can make money in all sorts of ways, um, but they don't conform to the models that we have today. But they were in what afforded them to be innovators, but not only their, uh, necessarily their uh, language skills, their class background, etc., but also um, simply the fact that, aside from their uh, tech skills, they already had the know-how and to think that they were going to stay in this industry as this is my career, this is potentially my identity, where it is completely not compatible with the way that sex workers work, and I'm not even talking about the clients, but just the people want to come make money and sometimes go and that's it. And they need a, a pre-set up model in which to work. And so the people who are doing most of the innovative work are definitely not uh, the sex workers themselves. Okay, uh, I think we are running out of time. I would like to invite you to a last round of question or ideas or inputs if you have. And if you don't, I, uh, yes, there's one, <laughs> just at the very end. So, uh, yes, the yes, yes, the microphone. Where is the microphone? Shall I? Okay. Um, I was totally fascinated. All of your contributions uh, added together gave me an incredible insight into stuff that I really hadn't understood at all before, so thank you very much. Uh, and I've never seen an industry that is so ripe for exactly the kind of disruption that Silicon Valley does so well, and I'm astonished I mean, you, you almost answered my question in your, in your last few uh, minutes, but what is stopping this? Because the current model, the current monopoly, is grossly abusive. It's massively vulnerable to legal challenge. It could be collapsed by any billions, you know, any venture capital-funded set of lawyers. They could just completely destroy that company and put them in jail. I mean, that's an extraordinarily abusive thing. And you just need to reframe the entire sex industry because it ties in with women in very vulnerable positions around the world. You need, just need to reframe it the way you reframed tuna as dolphin-friendly tuna, the way, you, <laughs> the way you reframe coffee as fair trade coffee. And you will, you, will, you will tap the guilt that Western males, Western females feel about, the, about indulging in pornography where they know, they can see that people are being badly treated and abused. It's such an extraordinary opportunity to create the Uber of porn that I'm amazed it hasn't been done. And what, 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 I, what is stopping this conversation you were saying that needs to happen between some venture capitalists, some entrepreneur, and, and some people within the, the industry? Why hasn't it happened yet? Uh, I'll take the first stab. Um, I think if you can create the marketing company that convinces Apple that they can convince middle America that sex isn't sinful, exploitative, potentially harmful to children. If you find the PR genius who can craft that message, you'll be a billionaire. But yeah. until then, no big Silicon Valley giant is gonna risk associating their brand with what, at least on the American market, I won't speak in the European, but on the American market, 50% of Americans 
think is an outright sin against God, sure. let alone potentially exploitative of children, women, and things where daughters who run away from bad homes find a very harrowing life. That message, is, we can say it's just an issue of rebranding, but rebranding <laughs> is one word. That process is cultural down from the political down to social level. That's a yeah. massive shift. It's just what we mentioned in our presentation, the fact that um, social stigma is trying to keep those, those people, those subjects who can make money out of pornography are those who are in society moral, by this moralize, moralization of sex work, you know, because of being racialized, gendered, um, uh, underlying homophobic and transphobic uh, power relations. They are those who actually can make money out of sex work because they are reduced to sexuality. So it's, it's not, it's not going to happen. Just, I agree with you. No, like, well, I'm, it, it, it I'm not happened, saying yeah. that. Go ahead. I, I think it happens slowly, and I think to his point about yeah. like capitalism always wins and exploits the weak. In America, in the last 10 years, from having a black president, from having gay marriage approved in several states, I think generally things do improve. And I think as much as there is still exploitation of genders and race, if you go back 50 years, every one of those demographics would hate their lives a hell of a lot more. I think generally the progress is improving, even if it's not at a pace that satisfies us, maybe that dissatisfaction fuels us to challenge the system more. I, I agree, just search. Yeah, I, I agree that it's improving, but it's improving only for some, and it's, it, it's, it's always recreating some sort of hierarchy. It's always specific class. Uh, uh, and racialized people who are though getting it forward. I mean, it's, it's, if, if somebody is, if, if, if there is a portion of population which is getting better, I'm for it. I'm for harm reduction. I mean, I'm with you. But I still think it's important to, to remain critical of it. But I, I think that's also one of the reasons in terms of uh, the, the question that you ask. I think pornography as an industry is the only one where we actually want public-private partnerships. The state has completely disinvested yes. from entirely talking about pornography as nothing more except for this object which needs to be regulated, yeah. right? The ability and the capacity of the state, so every single point that you are making is actually the state taking responsibility for better civil rights, better gender and sexuality agendas. Where is the state in the porn industry? True. It's nowhere. It's merely there to mitigate about whether this is porn or not. The capacity that we have given to private industries to determine what our expressions of desire are and how they are going to be capitalized, that's what needs to be disrupted. And we cannot exclude the state from it, but make it more responsible and responsive or to the needs that are coming up from this space. And working to diminish stigma. That this is something, working to diminish stigma is something that can be done yeah. as well yeah, okay. at the cultural level. I uh, say very sadly because you know when you enter in the hotness of the discussion, <laughs> let's, time let's is always over. Let's go get drunk over. and keep talking. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's the let's time to get drunk. You know. So I really thank you very much, all of you, and you really deserve a big round of applause for your intervention. Thank you very much. Please, Tatiana. Yeah, so first of all, I really want to thank you as well. I think it's been a really wonderful panel, and it's actually almost a pity to stop it because I was also really <laughs> engaging. And when you see that the people in the panel are really discussing a lot, uh, yeah, I think uh, this really shows that has been a wonderful uh, event. And so thanks a lot again. And uh, so as usual, our tradition is I would like now to uh, introduce the new topic for our next um, event that will be the 12th of December and actually it's going to be the last event of this year. Uh, hopefully we will go on, I mean we apply for funds so we hope to get them again but who knows, we don't know. And uh, so the topic is going to be stunts and so we are really happy to uh, finish with uh, a discourse of uh, total disruption and trying to understand also which kind of imaginative practice uh, we can have today to create uh, uh, playful, distributing and disruptive interventions. So the next event is going to combine uh, also hacking uh, with uh, uh, disruption as an artistic practice and also the last reflection on whistleblowing and the NSA surveillance. And so we will have as a keynote John Law, that is the former um, 
uh, co-founder of great group from San Francisco, like the Cacophony Society, the Suicide Club, that were like the pre-Burning Man festival, uh, collective uh, movements, and also the Billboard the Liberation Front, and then we will have a panel with also other great people like uh, uh, Jean Peter of the Peng Collective that just were really well known uh, here in Berlin for the last uh, <clears throat> action called Intellexit and then Mustafa al Bassan that was a former member of LALSEC so uh, also really great to have somebody like him here and uh, then uh, Messi McGrath speaking about the transparency toolkit and uh, Andrea Natella that was a former member of the Luther Blissett project in Italy. And the panel will be moderated by Ruth Katrov, that is also our uh, partner with the Forterfield platform. So I really uh, you know, welcome to come back in December and also I welcome everybody to join us uh, later at the party at the KitKat. Uh, so uh, there Francesco will play again and we will have a lot of fun. So Thanks a lot for being here, and I also want to thank all the wonderful people that <coughs> work with us. Uh, Daniela, Silvestine, and Kim Foss already thank at the beginning, but also like to thank at the end. <laughs> and our wonderful uh, video crew, the Rofso film, uh, Jonas Franchi, uh, our graphic uh, supersonic uh, designer, um, and um, Elisabeth Enke, our wonderful technician, and uh, Maria Silvano for the photos. So thanks a lot and see you the 12th of December.